1997. A ranch in northeastern South Dakota. A fossil hunter is on a routine dig when he suddenly spots the remains of a large dinosaur jutting out of the side of a hill. To identify the bones, paleontologists now rely on experience and acute knowledge of what other species of dinosaur have been found in the same area. Usually when you're finding dinosaurs, you got a pretty good idea as to what you're gonna find. If you're in the late Cretaceous, you have a good chance of finding like a duckbill dinosaur or a triceratops or a tyrannosaurus. And so you've got some idea of who the cast of characters are you might find. But very often it's not until you've actually excavated a series of bones that you can really start to get a handle on what kind of dinosaur you have. If I find uh, even a fragment of a tooth, with the serrations on it of a carnivorous dinosaur, I can often tell you exactly what kind of carnivorous dinosaur that belongs to. I don't need a whole tooth to tell you what it is. I can tell from the size, I can tell from the shape of the serrations, and so on. Paleontologists uncovered more of the skeleton and then compared them to the bones of other dinosaurs found nearby they realized they were looking at a monster. It was a duck-billed dinosaur, Edmontosaurus. These dinosaurs were over 40 feet long, stood 13 feet at the hips, and weighed nearly four tons, about the size of a railroad boxcar. These are really big dinosaurs with massive tails, but their body design is perfectly balanced so that their center of gravity is directly over their hips. This allows them to grow large, but still remain fairly agile. Their size is impressive, but what makes these duck-billed dinosaurs look so cool is that real funky skull. The feature that earned them the name duckbill was an elongated nose and flat beak. But one of the most striking features of the dinosaur was that its mouth housed well over a thousand teeth. And like a modern shark, it lost and grew new teeth throughout its life. They had a battery of, of 1,300 teeth in their, in their jaws at one time that would just keep growing and growing and growing. They would grind their food. Uh, they, they ate, we found actually, stomach contents in some of these animals, showing that they ate sequoias and other plants that were found in the region. The ability to chew through plants allowed Edmontosaurus to swarm across much of prehistoric Earth. We find them preserved in the uplands, so in the more woody parts in the hills, the foothills of the early Rockies. We find them in the stream valleys. We find them in swampy environments. We even find duckbills that lived all the way down to the coasts. So that some of them lived on the shores. So a duckbill like Edmontosaurus, we find actually in several different types of environments. It functioned pretty well in forests, in the streams, in the swamps. As long as it could find some plants to eat, a duckbill was happy. It's their ability to eat the tough plants of the late Cretaceous that allows Edmontosaurus to outcompete and ultimately replace earlier dinosaurs like Tenontosaurus. And it also allowed them to grow 40 feet in length and stand tall enough to look through the upstairs window of a two-story house. Edmontosaurus was one of the largest herbivores in North America. Its large size also helped protect it from vicious predators. Once these dinosaurs reached adulthood, their size made them less of a target from attack. The juveniles and subadults, on the other hand, were in constant danger, especially the subadult males. Once they reached a certain age, I think they were driven from the herd and sent off on their own to mature and form herds of their own. A single bull would need to be on the alert to every form of danger. Lacking armor and obvious weapons, at first glance, this dinosaur looked like easy prey. But when investigators inspected the skeletal design, they found that they were far from helpless. A 
big adult Edmontosaurus is bigger than a rhino, as big as an Indian elephant. So that's a big hunk of meat. If you're that big, you can defend yourself just by whapping your tail around, by kicking out with your legs, and even by smacking it with that big duck bill. If you're an Edmontosaurus and you're under attack, the first thing you want to do is run away. Although it's a fairly large animal, it was still relatively fast. But if it couldn't outrun its attacker, then it used its massive tail. It could swing that thing like an oversized baseball bat and crush its opponent if it could hit him. Today, there's one clear link that gives scientists insight into prehistoric behavior. It's animal instinct, which does not change through thousands of generations. Well, Montosaurus was sort of the wildebeest of the Cretaceous Plains. It was actually larger than a wildebeest, but in terms of dinosaur communities, it would be in that approximate size range. The reality is, is they probably had a couple of different strategies to deal with predators. So one of which is by their sensory component, where they actually have a good sense of hearing, they have a good sense of vision, um, they can sense, sense the predators and avoid them before the predators get close enough to do any damage. Another strategy that virtually all, or many, many prey animals have today is to have many sensory systems working at the same, same time. In other words, they live in groups, they live in herds. Consequently, the idea of predator detection becomes enhanced with living in a group. Fossil evidence found in sites throughout North America suggested that these dinosaurs traveled in herds. They lived in very, very large herds, perhaps as many as 10 to 20,000 individuals in a herd. Clearly, they had to migrate. There's no way you can support large herds like that without them moving around because they're going to literally decimate uh, the foliage in an area as, they, as they're moving along. But the remains of the site only showed one duckbill. Why wasn't it in a herd? Since this duckbill skeleton was found by itself, it's easy to believe that it was either separated from the herd or was alone when it was attacked. There's no evidence that any other duckbills were with it. When feeding, these dinosaurs stood on all fours. But there was one stunning feature in the way it moved. When they had to, Duckbills had a special adaptation. They walked on two legs. We know by studying a lot of fossil footprints that Edmontosaurus and its relatives walked on two legs most of the time. I'm sure that larger members found it easier to walk on all fours, but when they needed to, they could get up on their hind legs and run. Maybe not incredibly fast, but hopefully faster than their attacker. In 1998, the investigation deepened. CAT scan research was performed by Larry Whitmer. The scans revealed a vital clue. The Edmontosaurus may not have been as fast as previously thought. One idea that we can do uh, to, to get some sense of, of the agility of these animals is to actually look inside their heads and look at the structure of, of the brain and particularly the inner ear, which we can get from CT scanning. And what that tells us is that indeed, adult edmontosaurs were probably not particularly agile animals. They were probably not particularly fleet of foot. They were not relatively quick moving. Certainly not as, as sort of plodding as, as what we think many of the, the long neck sauropods were like. When paleontologists CAT scan dinosaur skulls, they get a very clear idea of the shape of the brain. By comparing that brain to modern animal brains, they're able to figure out which part of the brain is dedicated to which sense. So if the olfactory section of the brain is enlarged, then it tells scientists that the animal's sense of smell was more advanced than one with a smaller part of the brain dedicated to that same sense. 
So the use of CAT scanning is an example of how experts are able to give us an idea of a dinosaur's vision, hearing, and even speed and agility. But as more of the skeleton was unearthed from the hillside, the mystery deepened. Most of the skeleton was missing. The only body part that remained was its tail. The tail was a staggering 23 feet long. But what could have happened to the other half of this dinosaur? Had it been attacked and partially eaten? Then another discovery. The tail was covered in fossilized skin. It had been mummified. The discovery of fossilized skin is not unheard of, but it's remarkably rare. I've had the opportunity to study a large duckbill named TC whose neck and body parts are covered in fossilized skin. We don't fully understand the process that causes some dinosaur skin to mummify, but the end result allows us to study the skin texture of the dinosaur. We're unable to determine the original skin color, but at least we get a look at the thickness and texture. The discovery of a duckbill dinosaur tail covered in skin was unprecedented, but it would pale in comparison to what they found next. A second beast and forensic proof of massive dinosaur carnage that took place over 65 million years ago.